All right, can you all hear me well? Good. Uh, so first of all, it's a pleasure for me to be part of this symposium. I'm looking forward to the rest of it and also to be part of um, discussions on how we can have collaboration perhaps in the future between Yale and Todai. Uh, the past discussion was a perfect lead up to my talk. I'm going to continue to talk about aerosols. Uh, I'm going to talk about the effect that aerosols can have on ice clouds today. And there's a role to play for those effects both in climate forcing and also in a recently proposed geoengineering mechanism. And I've decided to uh, focus mostly on my work on, on this geoengineering mechanism today. Um, so uh, I've listed my uh, collaborators for, for that work below. Um, and uh, so I want to start by uh, giving you a short outline of my talk. So I'll continue to talk about black carbon for a little bit, because I knew that Professor Kondo would talk about that. Uh, and talk about the, also the importance of uh, aerosol effects on uh, clouds in that context. And then I'll move on to talk about cirrus seeding, seeding of cirrus clouds. And this is a geoengineering mechanism that was proposed a few years ago. And we've been studying this uh, lately. And so I'm going to try to uh, address the questions of how much to seed, where to seed, when to seed, and how much cooling we could possibly get from this kind of geoengineering mechanism. And then talk about the climate response uh, uh, that we see in, in our modeling to this kind of uh, geoengineering. Uh, so I, when I heard that Professor Kondo was going to come to Yale, I, w I was very excited and I, I looked up uh, some of his publications and I, and I discovered that we were actually co-authors. <laughs> and there's an excuse for me not being aware of that and that's that uh, we are two out of 31 uh, co-authors on the study that, that came out this summer. Uh, uh, it was a big review on uh, the effect of black carbon on climate. And it, it made a big splash. It received a lot of attention, uh, especially from policymakers when it came out, because one of the conclusions from that paper uh, was that um, black carbon is, in fact, the second largest climate warmer after carbon dioxide. This contradicted the last IPCC report, which uh, had methane being the, the second most important climate um, Warmer, but he, in in this paper, uh, they they came up with this, or we came up, I should say, with this larger uh, estimate of how much black carbon warms climate. And I think part of the reason why it received so much atten uh, attention, uh, and the reason why policymakers were excited, was that the steps that we need to take to reduce black carbon, people seem to be a, a little more comfortable with them than the steps that we need to take to reduce um, CO2 emissions, which Usually that involves major uh, changes in our, in our lifestyle. So people, people were excited uh, about this prospect of, of uh, reducing the positive forcing of climate by reducing by carbon emissions. And, and so the recommendation from this paper was that we reduce uh, emissions from diesel engines and also uh, cook stoves. Uh, and so this uh, figure here, uh, Professor Kondo also showed, um, and here's the estimate that, uh, that causes this uh, uh, climate um, forcer to be the second most important uh, warming component uh, after CO2. So the best estimate here was a 1.1 uh, watts per meter square warming uh, that, that can be compared to 1.7 watts per meter squared for, for CO2 between pre-industrial times and present day. Whereas methane, I think the best estimate in the last IPCC report was 0.5 watts per meter squared. Uh, what was perhaps not as well communicated in the press release was that black carbon is not emitted in isolation. It's co-emitted with other species that are not necessarily warming. So when you account for this effect of the co-emitted species, you actually get a small cooling and not a warming. Uh, that's not necess necessarily the case for all different sources and, and hence this recommendation of reducing uh, emissions from diesel engines and cook stoves because these emissions have uh, enough dominance of black carbon that it would benefit climate to reduce them. Now, my contribution or my expertise uh, in, uh, in the context of this paper was uh, uh, the way that black carbon can influence clouds. 
And essentially, I was able to tell them that we don't really understand anything about them, which is perhaps not uh, something to be proud of. Well, it's not, not completely true. Uh, so particularly, my, my expertise here is on air, how uh, black carbon can affect these cold clouds, mixed phase clouds, and ice clouds. And the reason why we're so uncertain about these uh, processes I will say is largely because the lab community of my field haven't been able to tell us uh, how well uh, black carbon particles can act as ice nuclei in the atmosphere. So I will argue that we do have a fairly good understanding of these clouds if we were just told how efficient black carbon uh, was as an ice nuclei. And so I want to move on now to talk about these so-called uh, cold clouds or ice clouds and how aerosols can potentially affect them, and how it could be, uh, how aerosols could actually have a very uh, strong effect on climate through these clouds. Uh, so, uh, a nice schematic here showing uh, the types of ice-containing clouds that we have in our atmosphere. Uh, for the most of my talk, I'm actually going to be focusing on cirrus clouds, which are always ice, and uh, they have temperatures uh, colder than minus 40 degrees C. And then there's this whole temperature range where we find mixed phase clouds, so clouds that can contain uh, liquid only, ice only, or a combination of the two. And a lot of people are not aware, I believe, that you can actually have clouds consisting of liquid down to about minus 40 degrees C in the atmosphere. Uh, but you can also, in the other extreme end, you can also have clouds consisting uh, only of ice down to temperature, or up to temperatures close to zero degrees C. And what controls that is entirely the existence of so-called ice nuclei. So ice nuclei are insoluble aerosol particles that can help this phase transition from liquid to ice in the atmosphere. So for temperatures larger than minus 40, so in this mixed phase cloud temperature regime, Droplets cannot freeze spontaneously. They rely on the existence of these, or the presence of these ice nuclei to aid the phase transition, and it can happen through various pathways that I'm showing here. However, when you get to temperatures colder than minus 40, droplets can freeze, and these are solution droplets. They're, they're not pure water, but they can have uh, various solutes in them, or they will always have various solutes, solutes in them. But they, cannot, they can freeze um, spontaneously when you get down to temperature, temperatures colder than minus 40, but th that process still requires relatively high supersaturations over ice. And so because of that, there's still a role to play for ice nuclei, uh, insoluble aerosols, mm -hmm. at these much colder temperatures also. So uh, the reason for that is that uh, the way we think about cloud formation in the atmosphere uh, you have a, a rising air pa parcel that cools down and, and, and as it cools, you, uh, the supersaturation rises. And if you're talking about an ice cloud, now a cirrus cloud, once you get to the point where ice crystals form, uh, those ice crystals will then uh, start to grow and deplete water vapor. And from that point on, you bring supersaturation down. So if this was uh, a case of homogeneous nucleation, where droplets freeze spontaneously, you would require the supersaturation to reach about 50% before you could have ice crystal formation and bring supersaturation down again. But, but in the presence of ice nuclei, you can actually have ice forming much earlier than at 50% supersaturation. Uh, at at, at supersaturation is close to, not much above zero, in fact. And if you do have these ice nuclei present, you, you can prevent homogeneous freezing altogether. You can prevent those solution droplets from, from forming ice crystals altogether because those uh, few ice crystals forming on ice nuclei deplete water vapor and you never get to these very high supersaturations. All right, so what kind of particles in the atmosphere can act as ice nuclei? Uh, the candidates are black carbon, which we already heard a lot about. Um, and also biological particles and mineral dust. So here are nice images of black carbon. Uh, black carbon is very abundant in the atmosphere, very high in number of concentrations, but they're not very efficient ice nuclei. Uh, and in fact, lab people still uh, argue about whether, they, whether or not they can act as ice nuclei. Um, 
Biological particles, here's an example uh, of Pseudomona uh, syringae, a bacteria, which is extremely efficient at forming ice in the atmosphere. Uh, can form ice almost uh, up, to, you know, not much below uh, zero degrees C. So it's extremely efficient. Some of, some of these biological particles are extremely efficient ice nuclei, but there, there are just not enough of them. The reason for that is that they're actually quite large. So they will have a hard time getting transported far enough away or high enough high enough in the atmosphere to encounter ice clouds. And then there's perhaps the happy medium of mineral dust. They're medium efficient ice nuclei and they have medium abundance, but there's evidence that these are the, the mineral dust are the most important uh, ice nuclei in the atmosphere, the most uh, um, abundant natural ice nuclei in the atmosphere. But uh, uh, all of these, you know, the, the subset of these uh, aerosol groups that can act as ice nuclei are rare. So a, a key point here in this talk is that ice nuclei are very rare in the atmosphere. We don't have many of them. And so people have started thinking about, you know, since these natural ice nuclei are so rare, what would happen if we added artificial ice nuclei to the atmosphere? What would that do to the atmosphere? Uh, and people then started thinking about, thinking about how you could uh, take advantage of this for uh, the purpose of climate engineering or geoengineering. So before I uh, introduce this geoengineering mechanism that I'm, I'm going to address in this talk, I want to just briefly review how clouds affect uh, our radiation budget. So, um, sorry, clouds... Um, contribute to the greenhouse effect of the atmosphere, uh, about 30 watts per meter square. And they also um, contribute to Earth's planetary albedo. Mm -hmm. And that effect tends to win in the global uh, mean. So uh, clouds increase the scattering of solar radiation back to space by about 50 watts per meter squared. And so the total is still a cooling in the global mean. But not all clouds are the same in this context. So for example, low clouds are, have a really high albedo and very efficiently scatter sunlight back to space. So that's a strong cooling effect, but they're not as efficient at trapping long wave radiation because of their temperatures. So these clouds have a very strong cooling effect, but these high ice clouds are essentially transparent to solar radiation. So they let most of the solar radiation through to the surface, but they have very low temperatures, and that makes them very efficient at trapping long-wave radiation. So they, these clouds have a very strong warming effect. And so uh, for geoengineering purposes, people uh, have been thinking about how you can take advantage of these uh, cloud effects on climate if you wanted to uh, artificially cool climate. And so many people have been working on, in the, in the modeling world, on uh, increasing the amount of uh, the amount or reflectivity of low clouds so that you could cool climate that way. But you, another way of doing it would be to decrease the amount of high clouds that have a warming effect on climate. And so that's the, the mechanism that I'll be um, addressing next. Uh, so <clears throat> for cirrus clouds, I was talking about two ways that they can form, either through homogeneous nucleation, where solution droplets fr freeze spontaneously when you get to very high supersaturations. But they can, if they form in the presence of uh, ice nuclei, what happens is that ice crystals form on those ice nuclei at low supersaturation, and you prevent the supersaturations that are required for droplets to freeze spontaneously. And the, the cirrus cloud that results in those two different cases are very different. So in the one case, you form a, a cirrus cloud that contains many, many small ice crystals because there are very many uh, solution droplets around that can freeze in the upper troposphere. But if you do have ice nuclei present, they, they are never in high abundance. So you'd form an ice crystal, uh, sorry, a cirrus cloud that contains few and large ice crystals. So what this schematic is supposed to show is that this cloud is optically much thicker and therefore has a stronger warming effect than this cloud. Another issue is that these ice crystals will be sedimenting out of the cloud and the cloud will be removed much faster and have a shorter lifetime in the upper troposphere compared to this cloud. Um, so, uh, oops. Yeah. Uh, so in 2009, Mitchell and Finnegan uh, took advantage of this difference between these two uh, types of clouds and said, uh, 
Well, could, could cirrus clouds be, uh, be artificially converted from this type of cloud, which we think is the dominant in the current climate, to this type of cloud? And could, by doing that, could we then cool the climate? Uh, and they also proposed an artificial ice nuclei that you could, put, that you could inject into the upper troposphere. Uh, they propose bismuth triiodide, which is a very efficient ice nuclei at very cold temperatures, not as efficient at warmer temperatures, which, uh, you know, uh, so we could avoid effects on warmer clouds. So, um, so we decided then to, to, uh, to test this ID that they, that they came up with. And this uh, geoengineering mechanism sort of uh, adds to a group of already large uh, a, a already large group of, of geoengineering mechanisms that have been proposed. So you guys will already uh, you know, recognize some of the mechanisms that I'm showing here. Uh, an example is um, carbon sequestration. People have been suggesting that we could uh, put reflecting mirrors in orbit uh, around Earth and reflect sunlight that way, and that way we could cool climate. And also, uh, it's, it's been proposed that we could put uh, aerosols in the stratosphere uh, this was the ID that uh, uh, Paul Kurtzman, Nobel Prize winner, proposed a few years back, and that received a lot of attention, perhaps because of that. And, and there's been extensive study in, in climate models since then of this geoengineering mecha mechanism here. But this new uh, geoengineering mechanism that involves ice clouds has not really received uh, much attention or hasn't been carefully studied yet. And, and we thought we'd fix that. So um, we ran uh, model simulations. I'm not going to go into details about the model, because I think I'll put you to sleep that way. Uh, the, I only want to say that we used the NCAR CAM5 atmospheric global model. And we uh, put in some new parameterizations, some new treatment of um, cirrus clouds and the way that homogeneous and heterogeneous ice nucleation competes for water vapor in the upper troposphere. So we had that represented in the model. And if you want to know more about the model, then uh, feel free to ask. And so what we did in the model then, we, uh, we first ran control simulations allowing only homogeneous nucleation to take place. Because at the time when we did this work, that was the general wisdom was that cirrus clouds formed uh, mostly through droplets freezing spontaneously, so with homogeneous uh, nucleation. And then we experimented with uh, what the optimal amount of artificial ice nuclei would be that would give us this kind of effect that Mitchell and Finnegan proposed in 2009. And so with this optimal concentration of ice nuclei, we could in fact simulate a strong reduction in cirrus cloud uh, ice nuclei. So this is now a zonal mean, and this is height, um, given with pressure. So a uh, strong reduction in ice crystal amount at cirrus levels, and therefore each ice crystal became larger, but then that allowed them to sediment out much faster, so we got a lot less ice in the upper troposphere, and also a strong reduction in cloud coverage in the upper troposphere. So it was exactly the kind of effect that Mitchell and Finnegan proposed that, um, that could cool climate. And so uh, we did also find a strong cooling uh, of climate uh, in, the, in response to these changes. So here I'm showing the, the, the effect on the radiation budget uh, as a function of seeding concentrations. And I'm showing that for a few different simulations that vary the, the, the treatment of small scale dynamics in the upper troposphere. But they generally behave the same way. So when, when you put in low concentrations of artificial ice nuclei, it doesn't really do anything because there are not enough of them to suppress supersaturation enough that you don't get homogeneous nucleation. But then as you start increasing the, the concentration of seeding ice nuclei, you start, uh, start cooling because, because of the effects that I showed on the previous slide. You start cooling and you are now actually able to suppress homogeneous nucleation. So all ice crystals form on the artificial ice nuclei. And then you reach a maximum cooling for an optimal seeding amount or an opti optimal seeding concentration. And after that, if you keep increasing your seeding ice nuclei concentrations, what happens is you cross 
you cross zero here and you actually get a warming rather than a cooling. So it's the opposite of, of, of what you wanted in the first place. So there's this Goldilocks situation where too little doesn't give you any effect. Uh, too much gives you the opposite effect. It gives you a warming rather than a cooling. And then just the right amount of seeding ice nuclei will give you quite a lot of cooling. So this is a cooling that overwhelms the, the warming that we've had from increasing CO2 concentration since pre-industrial time. So this is quite a substantial cooling that you could get through, through this mechanism. And so that led me uh, and my co-authors to publish this paper earlier this year where we said, yes, cirrus cloud seeding has potential to cool climate. Uh, what happened shortly there, you know, and, and keep in mind uh, that the, these simulations relied on the assumption that cirrus clouds in the present atmosphere form homogeneously. The cirrus clouds don't form on ice nuclei, but they form on droplets that freeze spontaneously when, it, when you get high enough supersaturations. Well, shortly after we published this paper, um, a former colleague of mine, Dan Sitzo, published this paper in Science. Uh, reporting from field campaigns uh, where they had sampled ice crystals and, and analyzed, uh, did a, a chemical analysis of, of ice residuals. And essentially what you need to do here is you need to compare clear sky aerosols. So these are uh, compositions of aerosols measured in clear sky and then these uh, heterogeneous ice residuals here. And so they report from four field campaigns, and from each of the four field campaigns, they found in the ice crystal residuals, they found a very strong enrichment of dust. So dust is a brown category here. And as you go from clear sky to heterogeneous ice residuals, you see a very strong increase in dust. And so based on their analysis, they said, no, you know what? <coughs> Opposite of the, of the sort of general wisdom up until this point, we find that in 94% of our cloud encounters, clouds did not form homogeneously. They did not form by droplets freezing spontaneously. They probably formed on dust particles. Uh, seeing this publication, I thought, oh, great. I'm going to now have to uh, write another paper in the same year contradicting my, my, my first paper and say something like, as it turns out, no, SIRS has no potential to cool climate. All right, so uh, we started the sad, sad project of, of uh, running the simulations that would, that would uh, make this paper that contradicted our previous work. Um, and not, so now I'm presenting work that I, I had a wonderful um, visiting student from ETH actually uh, here this summer and she did it amazingly well. So I'm now presenting a lot of her work. And so what I'm showing here are again simulations from the same model and now we allowed in the, in the unperturbed, the unseeded atmosphere, we allowed some dust also to act as ice nuclei. So I'm showing two cases here. The upper row is for 5% uh, of dust particles uh, being active as ice nuclei. And the lower row is 50% of the dust particles being active as ice nuclei. And this fraction that I'm showing for summer here and winter here shows how, what fraction of ice crystals formed on dust versus, you know, relative to the total ice crystal concentration. And so you can see that we find in both these simu simulations, we find a balance between the two. It's not black or white as, uh, as it never really is. It, it's a balance between heterogeneous and homogeneous nucleation. And, and what happens is that there, there's more heterogeneous uh, nucleation in the summer, and there are two reasons for that. It's warmer, and when it's warmer, that fa favors heterogeneous nucleation over homogeneous nucleation, and there's more dust in summer than in winter. So the heterogeneous fraction is much higher in summer than in winter. But the, the key point here is that both of these simulations are actually compatible with the findings of, of my former colleague, where he, those field campaigns were made over North and Central America, and we've, we find that these simulations agree with those measurements, uh, but we also find that there's, there's still quite amount of uh, homogeneous nucleation happening in, in these simulations. So then we went, went ahead and, and did seeding of, these, of a, a group of simulations. So we had now the same old homo homogeneous control case, and then a few cases where we had both homogeneous and heterogeneous nucleation in the control case, and we just varied the amount of dust that could act as an ice nuclei. Uh, 
And then we have one where we said, in the present atmosphere, all ice crystals form on dust in, uh, in cirrus clouds. And so for, for all these simulations that uh, have a, a mix of homogeneous and heterogeneous nucleation, we could actually get almost as much cooling uh, as we had in the, in the pure homogeneous case that we had in our first publication. So we actually could still say that, yes, cirrus seeding has the potential to cool climate. We got a little less cooling here in, in the uh, mid-latitudes of the northern hemisphere where we have the most dust and therefore had the less ideal starting point for seeding. But there's still substantial cooling for all these cases. Now, if we do have uh, an atmosphere right now where all ice crystals form heterogeneously, then seeding would be a very bad idea because you'd actually get a warming instead of a cooling. So again, that's, that's something we would want to be sure of uh, before we went ahead and, and, and seeded. Um, so, uh, and, and again, you can also see that we, we get the maximum, because I'm now showing this uh, cooling as a function of latitude, so we get a maximum cooling at high, mid and high latitudes and very little cooling in the tropics and subtropics. In fact, sometimes we get uh, the opposite in the, the tropics and subtropics. Uh, we get a, a warming uh, rather than the cooling or, or very little effect. So if we were ever to get to a point of implementing this geoengineering mechanism, and trust me, I'm not necessarily a proponent of that, but um, if we did, and if we wanted to be practical, and, and, and let's say we were the ones paying for the seeding material, we would never want to seed in this region because that, that would be a, a waste of uh, aircraft fuel and seeding material. Uh, so we definitely would want to seed uh, high uh, and mid latitudes if we were going to go ahead. And so why is that? Why is it that we don't see much of an effect uh, in the tropics and subtropics? Well, it's because there is a competition uh, uh, when we reduce the amount of cirrus, there is a competition between the long wave effect. So we are able to uh, reduce the greenhouse effect, which is what I'm showing here, and that is, amounts to cooling everywhere. But we are also reducing the albedo a little bit. The long wave effect wins uh, on average, but the, sh the short wave effect, the effect of less solar radiation reflected back to space maximizes where you have the most solar radiation in the first place, which is in the tropics and subtropics. So what you, what you want to do is you want to minimize this, the effect of, of, uh, of solar radiation and you want to maximize the long wave. And so you know, that is the reason why, you, again, you don't want to seed uh, where you have a lot of sunlight. You want to uh, seed where it's, it's dark, you know, <laughs> relatively dark. So that would be the winter hemispheres and um, high latitudes in general. So uh, Nadia, uh, the, the visiting student, came up with these seeding functions, though, uh, to, to try to think about, well, for what kind of, um, what kind of zenith angles will we want to seed? And where, for what zenith angles do we not want to seed? So, for, so she tried different functions here for where we would implement seeding in our simulations and where we wouldn't. And in the end, we chose two simulations uh, or seeding functions. Seeding function Y1 is, corresponds to these green bars, and that also corresponds to a seeding of about 45% of the globe. And then a seeding function Y2, which corresponds to seeding about 15% of the globe. And again, I'm now just showing the net cloud forcing here, so the, the, the cooling effect uh, that it has, the effect that it has on the energy balance of the Earth. And so the blue ones here represent the old uniform seeding all over the globe. And very interestingly, when we avoid seeding in the tropics or, and subtropics, we could actually get more of a cooling. So we could get more of a cooling by seeding only 45% you know, of the globe uh, than when we seeded the whole globe. So that's a no-brainer if, if we ever got to the point of, of implementation. But even in this case of seeding 15% of the globe, uh, you could get uh, almost as much uh, cooling as you did with uniform seeding all over the globe. And, and you get this kind of cooling for all our, all our cases. Again, if, if, ice, if cirrus clouds form uh, on dust particles uh, entirely in the present atmosphere, 
this seeding would be a very bad idea. All right, so finally, let me talk about um, climate responses to uh, the, this uh, geoengineering mechanism. So uh, I'm now showing simulations for these two different seeding strategies. One, the upper one here, shows the cooling uh, when you seed 45% of the globe, and the bottom one here shows the cooling when you seed 15% of the globe. And these are now from fully coupled atmosphere-ocean simulations, where the, the atmosphere is still, uh, well, the whole model is still the NCAR model with some modifications done by us. And so you see a clear um, polar amplification, uh, as, as expected. And you also see uh, a cooling in the global mean of about 1.2 degrees Celsius. So this by far overwhelms the, the warming that we've seen so far uh, due to increasing greenhouse gas concentrations, this upper panel. And then this, this uh, seeding strategy where only 15% of the globe is seeded or geoengineered, uh, we get a cooling of a little less, so 0.9. Uh, degree C of cooling, still a substantial cooling and, and something that overwhelms the warming that we've seen so far. Um, I should add though that these, um, these figures come from simulations that haven't, uh, haven't fully completed yet. So uh, uh, they're preliminary, but I don't expect many changes, but these, these simulations are actually still running, these couple simulations, to make sure that we have reached equilibrium for them. Um, and at that point, we, all, we are also obviously going to look at uh, effects on the hydrological cycle and so on, circulation patterns. Um, so for now, I'm, I'm just going to show the effect on Arctic sea ice. So on the left-hand side here, I'm showing the annual cycle of Arctic sea ice. So the solid line here is the median over a 30-year period, and then there's a shading of plus and minus 2 standard deviations around it. And the dash curve here is the minimum that we reached last year. Uh, so there was a record low reach for Arctic sea ice for the satellite era, I should add, uh, uh, in 2012. And then this red brownish curve is what happened this year. And um, not, not a new uh, record minimum, but still uh, you know, much lower than the median. Uh, and so I'm showing here from the control simulation the same cycle. Uh, the blue curve here is the amount of Arctic sea ice in our control simulations. And you can see from this, and if you can see the numbers here, you can see that the control simulation keeps, uh, does not keep enough Arctic sea ice. It's a slightly too warm. But, but so, so this minimum is a little too low for at least for what we're observing currently for Arctic sea ice. But the main point here is that when we introduce seeding, and this is, uh, again, for the 45% of the globe seeded, we, um, we get a significant increase in the amount of Arctic sea ice, especially at the time of the minimum, when the minimum is reached. And here's uh, also shown as the increase in, in sea ice thickness and sea ice area uh, as a response to the seeding. Uh, and that brings me to my conclusion. So, uh, our numerical simulations show that uh, this strategy of seeding cirrus clouds for the purpose of, of cooling climate does have the potential to cool by as much as 1.2 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, the optimal seeding amount uh, appears to lie uh, around 10 to 100 uh, seeding ice nuclei per liter. But it does depend on fine-scale dynamics of the upper troposphere, which was something I didn't talk much about. Uh, globally, non-uniform seeding strategies could give as much cooling, or even actually more cooling, than, than seeding the whole globe. So there's no reason for seeding the whole globe if we were ever to go ahead with this geoengineering mechanism. So there are clearly some major unknowns related to this, this uh, geoengineering mechanism, and we're just beginning to, to um, you know, analyze whether it's viable or not. Um, so one issue is how would we actually build up, once we know what the optimal uh, amount of seeding con concentration is, how will we build it up? And this is a something, these particles will have to be continuously replaced, right? They would sediment out and we would have to replace them with new ones, so this would involve perhaps flying drones uh, in, in the upper troposphere. 
uh, or something along those lines. Uh, we also need to address, not me, but the people who know about environmental fate and, and tox toxicity uh, of different materials will need to address that if this was ever to be a viable uh, geoengineering mechanism. Oh, and this, this was something that I actually took out of my, my talk to, uh, because I decided I didn't have time, so you can ignore this last point. Uh, so I, I think with that, I'll, uh, I'll finish my talk and perhaps just say that, um, again, that I'm, I'm not necessarily a proponent of introducing geoengineering mechanisms, but I could imagine that we find ourselves at some point in a situation where the alternative may be worse, and I, at that point, uh, it's important to me that we've done careful analysis of these different geoengineering mechanisms in a laboratory where we can do no harm, and that's a global climate model, and so that's what we're doing. Thank you.